Good morning, Southside. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jason Sweezy. I'm a deacon here. Um, usually I'm in the back because that's where I like to keep me. So that's um, not unusual. If you've never seen me, I don't blame you. Um, what we want to look through this morning is going to be John 13. You already heard Nick read it, and Nick really captured most of the passage just in his prayer. So, Nick, thanks. Love you, as always. Um, we're the book of John. Uh, we've been studying this in our community group Tuesday nights for the about better part of two years now. Um, we've been going through verse by verse, looking at all the different details, the different pieces of it, and the brilliance of it is really the, 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 the piece of it as a whole, right? And that's really where... It, I want to bring this morning to look at see what John's talking about, to see the picture that John's painting. Uh, it's not just a series of verses and theology and, and, and things that prove out sovereignty and things that prove out the role of the Spirit. And I've always been guilty of kind of parting it out that way and treating it in sections and, and, and pieces and, and just taking um, little pieces of it by itself. But when you start putting together the whole, you start to get a picture of who Jesus Christ is, and you start to get a picture of who we are as we look at him. And, and that's really what I want to concentrate on this morning, is seeing the grand picture uh, that John's painting for us here uh, of our Lord in John 13. So if you would, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into the text. Lord, we pray this morning for your grace. Just pure and simple, Lord, that we would see from your text, to see who you are, to put you on display, that you would be magnified in the words that we speak, Lord, in the, in the words that we read. We pray, Lord, as we, we read and we see these things, that you would have your spirit visit, uh, that he would uh, enlighten our hearts, that he would grow us all, Lord, that we would be leaving here changed men and women, Lord. We pray that you would be um, on your throne even this morning. Lord, we pray in all our weaknesses and all of our misses and all of our mistakes and all of our sins this week that we would put that aside. Lord, that there would be only one thing this morning, and that would be you. So, Lord, we pray uh, for your grace, and we pray for your mercy, and we pray for attentiveness, and we pray that uh, your word would be made much of even this morning. And it's your name we pray. Amen. All right. So what's happening in John 13? John 13 is the end of Jesus' public ministry. Um, if we go back a little bit, we've had um, a lot of things happening in the book of John. We've seen the, um, Jesus as the light of the world. We've seen him do miracles. We've seen him heal the sick. We've he seen him uh, give sight to the blind. He's done all these things. He's taught wonderful lessons. He's been attacked multiple times, and he's had miraculous escapes. He's, had, um, he's talked to a Samaritan woman, which you just didn't do in that time, and, and he's been so thoughtful, and he's been so faithful, and he's walked in all the ways that the Father would give him. He is the perfect son who has come to do the will of the Father, and he's done it with perfection, and with glory, and with honor, and with per absolute perfection, and it's just been wonderful to watch. And, 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 but now it's time to finish that part of the ministry. He's done with that part of the ministry to this world. He has come now, and he's going to finish off the role that which he's come. He has come to fulfill the purpose that the Father has given him as the Son. And that's what we've come to in John 13. In John 11, he came back to Jerusalem for the final time, and he raised Lazarus. Now, why does that matter? Well, he did that because it was the camel that would break it was the straw that broke the camel's back, because the other way around just makes no sense whatsoever. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the thing that brought the wrath of the Pharisees to a head. And so now he's building up this picture. In John's narrative, he's building up a picture of what's happening. He's got Lazarus being raised, but, which is awesome, but he's got now the Pharisees chasing after him. He's got the priests. He's got the whole leadership of Israel coming with a murderous intent on putting an end to Jesus. We get that in John 11. So what's the response to that? Well, you don't hide. You go ahead and do a triumphal entry. And so in John 12, Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and he's got the entire population of Jerusalem, which some commentators think might have topped over a million people, all waving palm branches and singing Hosanna. Well, that's awesome. Here's the target for the Pharisees coming in and making himself even more of a target, 
right? And so they're singing, here comes our freedom, here comes our liberator, here comes everything that we've been waiting for, so they thought, and, but he comes in as a donkey. And so John tells us that this donkey is, is symbolic. He's not coming into freedom. There we go. Um, a political freedom. He's coming in to establish an actual freedom, because if you look at what he's fulfilling, it is a kingdom of grace, a kingdom of of mercy. And he comes, and finally, as he comes into this entry, he's approached by, uh, by Greeks, by Gentiles, and he tells us that his hour has now come. And his hour, just so you know, as you read through the book of John, and the hour of Jesus he refers to multiple times, and that is shorthand for the cross. Jesus' hour is the cross, it is the resurrection, it is the glorification, it is everything. It is the point of all redemptive history. The hour of Jesus is everything that God's been purposed for all time. Everything, every little detail that has gone on for thousands of years throughout redemptive history is pointed at the cross. It is the, it is the capstone, it is the inflection point, it is everything, everything throughout redemptive history, not just in the book of John, but in all of redemptive history. So when Jesus says his hour has come, that's got to arrest us. There's something significant happening. There is the, major, the, major, the most major thing you can think of right now is about to happen at this point in time. And so that's the way that John 12 ends. Jesus is done preaching. The rest of the book, he's going to preach to his disciples, and then he's going to go to the cross, and then he's going to be resurrected. Simple outline, profound implications. So that takes us to John 13. So let's go ahead and jump into our actual text now. In John 13, 1, we start with these words. Now, before the feast of the Passover. Now, some of you may know what the Passover is. Some of you may not. And I'm going to give it a, just a fraction of understanding to it. But let's walk through it. This comes from the book of Exodus. Um, this comes from what's happening as Israel is stuck under Egyptian oppression. So at the end of Genesis, uh, Israel is brought um, to Egypt to escape a famine. As they stay there for years, uh, they become slaves. And Egypt oppresses them, and they're, they're frightened of them, and they want to hold them down. And so God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, decides he's going to go and rescue them. This is his people. He is going to make them his people. He's going to defend them. And so he leads them out, and he brings them, and he brings them Moses, and then he brings them Aaron, and he sends Moses to talk to Pharaoh. And he says, Pharaoh, you need to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, forget it. I really like having these servants. I'm not going to let them go. And, Pharaoh, and that was a really, really bad move. That was a really, really really bad move. And so Moses says, all right, well, then there's going to be things that are going to happen. And God proceeds to then do things. And he's going to do plagues. And he's going to send frogs, which is, sounds weird, but it all has a purpose. And then he turns rivers, rivers to blood and all these things that it, when you think of, it's kind of gross. But um, if, you're, if you're unsure, I would read your Bible. I would not watch the movie there's a movie that's about this. It's not worth watching. Let's go to our Bibles, right? So let's read this Bible and let's understand what's happening. The, the, what you want to get out of this is that God has come and he's rescued his people. And the last plague that was sent on the Egyptians is to kill their firstborn. And so he's going to go kill the firstborn of all animals, of all people, of everything. But there's one caveat to that. There's one caveat. And the caveat is if... if you will sacrifice the lamb and take the blood of that lamb and you will wipe it on the doorposts, on the lintels of your doorposts, which is just basically like the vertical part. It, it, he says, put this blood on you and when the angel of death comes, he will pass over any house that has the blood. Now, what we have to take from that is it's not the magic on the blood. It wasn't the animal that did this. It was the faith and believing and trusting that God would pass over that actually saved them. It wasn't the actual animal sacrifice. Okay? We've got to take that away. If you, if you get it wrong, you've messed up all of your theology. It's not what it was about. It was about the faith that believed that God would cover them. And so he takes, you, they take the blood, they wipe it on the doorposts, and, and, and that causes the angel to pass over them. He kills the firstborn of the animals, he kills the firstborn of Pharaoh, but he does not touch any of Israel because they had the blood. They had the saving power that God had given them. And so here we have in John 13 this 
remembrance, this ceremony, this gigantic theme as the backdrop to John 13. This is where Jesus is sitting. As we're thinking about the Passover, Jesus is considering how God passed over and had mercy on the nation of Israel. And guess what's going to happen now? As he's thinking about this, the very next words are, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. So now he's thinking of the Passover and how God saved Israel thousands of years ago, a thousand, okay, whatever. He saved him in the past, and now Jesus is thinking about the cross. And so now the cross and the Passover are brought into absolute parity. Why? Because the cross is the Passover. Because the reason the Passover exists is to point to the cross. It is Jesus' blood that's going to be painted on our hearts that will lead to salvation for everyone, not just Israel, but from all mankind. You will not be saved from an oppressing national power. You will be saved from the oppression of sin. You will be saved from the judgment that comes with your hardened heart. That is what the Passover was really about. The Passover pointed to the cross. And as Jesus is coming into John 13, and he's looking at the Passover that's being celebrated, what he's remembering is the cross. He's remembering how this all comes together. He's remembering the whole point of all of history. It's all being summarized at this moment. And this is what's on Jesus' mind right now. Now, before the feast of the Passover, as you're remembering national deliverance, here comes Jesus saying, now remember all deliverance, ultimate deliverance, ultimate themes, huge, huge themes of, of ultimate forgiveness, of ultimate direction. All of history is coming to a point, and it's right here. And so what does that cause him to think about? He's not thinking about theology. Look what it says. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. As Jesus thinks about the grand scheme of history, as he thinks about the ultimate purposes of God, as he thinks about how all things are going to come into play right at this moment, guess what he thinks about? He thinks about his people. He loves them while they're in the world. These people that are not perfect, the people that are sinful, the people that still have so many warts and so many problems, he loves them. He loves them to the end, it says. And the end could be time, it could be completeness. Some of your Bibles may say to the uttermost, totally legitimate. He's basically saying, I've loved them completely, totally, as much as they could ever need. He loves them to the absolute perfection perfect amount. He loves them completely. The theology and the themes and the redemptive history are not separate from the love that he has for his people. The love of God and the ultimate purpose and the glory of God is not divorced from the love for people. And if your theology can't handle that, then we, that's the thing that we're going to talk about today, because your theology has to lead you to the same place. It has to lead you to the same place. He loved the Father, and he loved the plan of the Father, and part of loving the plan of the Father was to love the people that God had given him, and that's what he does. He loves them to the end. He brings his love completely to the end. It is awesome and holy, and I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's move on. John 13, 2. And supper being ended, or or probably a better way to understand that is, and supper being served. And if you have questions on that, come find me afterwards. We'll talk more about it. Supper was being served. So they're sitting there. He's sitting at the table. He's got these 12 guys around him. And they're sitting at the table ready to eat. And, and guess what's on his mind? Well, John 13, 2 tells us that the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So now we've got this additional theme. We started with... Lazarus in John 11. We went to the triumphal entry in John 12. And then in John 13, we see the Passover. And then we see the cross linked to the Passover. So we've got these major themes. We've got murder from the Pharisees. We've got uh, triumphal entry and, and, and national pride and, and deliverance coming in. We've got the history coming in in the Passover. We've got the cross coming in and all of redemptive history coming to a completion. And then just to add a little bit more to it, here's betrayal being added to it. So the devil is coming to Judas and he's tempting him. And you can go back to Ephesians 6 and we can look at the fiery darts of temptation and there's a lot of themes in this. But suffice it to say that the devil doesn't possess Judas, but he appeals to Judas enough that Judas makes a decision in his mind at this point to go and betray Jesus. Whatever it is that Judas loved was going to be found by betraying Jesus. How? It's not important. 
What is important is that he made that equation in his mind. That Judas decided it was better to betray Jesus. It would give him more of what he wanted. And who was behind that? Well, the devil tempted him and tempted him and tempted him and kept going, and now it finally worked out. The plan of the devil is being played out. So now we've got spiritual warfare being added to our themes of deliverance and redemptive history. We've got betrayal. We've got murder. We've got so many things going on. This is like a tagline to a movie. We could make, we could make a trailer out of this, really. This is like you could put this onto a movie and it'd be perfect. Because when you think about all these things that are happening at this moment, all of these huge themes coming together, betrayal by the devil, there's themes, there's spiritual warfare. And then look at John 13, just to add a little bit more to it in case you didn't catch it the first time. And knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, so Jesus is the ancient of days. He is the uh, son of man who has been given all authority by the ancient of days. He is going to rule over all things. And then he, that he came from God and was going to God. So now we're back to John 1, which takes place before Genesis 1.1, where Jesus is talking about that he was face to face with the Father. And he had all the glory of the Father. And he sat on the throne of heaven with the Father. And he was having perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. And then now he's going to go back to that same glory. And he's going to sit on this throne. And, and Ken's been going through Philippians. All, every knee shall bow. Everything's going to happen. All things are going to happen to him. So let's just kind of take this theme and let it weigh on you because I want John's picture to really weigh on your hearts right now. We've got murder. We've got Passovers. We've got all of redemptive history. We've got the biggest themes across all of glory happening right in front of our face. Jesus is happening, talking about thrones and dominions and power and everything, all these grand themes of your Bible, these themes that people write whole systematic theologies about. This is everything. Your thick book of Grudem's systematic theology is right in front of us, and he's talking about all these things. Now let's see where it leads him, because in John 13, 4, this is the outcome from all those gigantic themes. Jesus rises from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. No, it doesn't say that he started explaining all these things. He doesn't try to explain the mechanics of what, the, what it looks like. He doesn't try to explain how all of time will end. He doesn't try to do anything complex. He simply rises up from supper, takes a towel, and he washes feet. All these gigantic themes of redemptive history, of glory. He's going to take a throne. He's going to have dominion over all the creation that he already created. He's going to have all these things. They're all there, along with murder, along with the cross, along with betrayal, along with the devil, whispering in his ears, all these things happening. And where does it lead him? It leads him to wash feet. That was the next step of redemptive history. Isn't that crazy? This gigantic picture that he just painted for us in the verse, three verses finds its fruition in the washing of feet. That's where Jesus' theology, if you will, brings him. Is that where your theology brings you? You can take all those themes and, and it leads you to service. It leads you to love. When you think about fulfilling God's word, is it grand books and, and theology and wanting to understand more and more and more about the Bible? Or does it find its fruition in saying, God, let me go where you're taking me. Let me serve the people that you've put into my life. Let me follow you wherever you lead, whether that's to the cross or whether that's to stinky feet. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to follow you wherever you go because I love you and I trust you and I honor you and that's where it's going. This is the point of the Son. The Son came to fulfill the will of the Father. And the will of the Father right now was to wash feet. The will of the Father in a few hours will be to go to the cross. But the will of the Father right now all these themes lead Jesus to wash feet. And that's really the point of this whole section. It's not about humility, per se. It's not about even just being a servant. It is about trust. It is about love. It is about taking all the glory of heaven and finding its expression in service, in humble service of whoever God has for you. So let's look at these details in verse 4 and verse 5 because they all have a purpose. 
All right? There's nothing in the Bible that does not have a purpose. Every word has some reason for being there, and these ones do as well. So John 13, 4, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments. Now, that seems pretty obvious, but it's actually not. When they, when they would sit down and have the Passover feast, is, which is what they're having right now, they would actually start with prayers. It would start with a liturgy. It would start with a reading. It would be remembering what happened to Israel so long ago. And, and they would all be ready for this. All the disciples are sitting there, having gone through this for years and years of their lives. They know the routine. They know what's supposed to be said. They know what's supposed to be uh, prayed for at that moment. And Jesus, instead of offering a prayer, what does he give to them? Himself. He rose from supper. As they're all putting their heads down to pray, Jesus says, all right, here's your prayer. Here's the amen to your prayer. It's me. And so he rises from supper, and he lays aside his garments. And so that seems kind of odd to us, um, but the idea being that he's going to take his robe, uh, his outer robe, the one that would have been a little bit more ornate, the one that would have indicated his station in life, and he's going to lay it aside. And in place of that, he takes a towel, and he wraps it around his waist. And what that really signifies is being a servant. That's the garment of a servant. So he lays aside his glory, and he takes on the, the appearance of a man or as a servant. That sounds oddly familiar to things we've been hearing from the pulpit for the last month or so, right? This is what we're bringing in. He's laying aside his glory. He's bringing this towel. He's serving. And there's a picture of the gospel. There's a picture of the ultimate fulfillment of all things. Here he is, the glory of the Son of Man who was in face-to-face, in John 1-1, face-to-face with the Father, who loved the Father, who had perfect fellowship, he leaves heaven. He decides that it's not something to be grasped. He lays aside his glory, and he takes on the, the towel, the servant, the appearance of a man so that he can serve men. There is the gospel in these, one, these simple statements. So he rose from supper. He, as they're ready to pray, he offers himself, and he lays aside his garments, and he takes a towel, and he girds himself. Um, after that, he poured water into a basin. See, I got that right here. And he began to wash the disciples' feet. All right, so what's happening here? It seems kind of obvious, right? And it is. There actually is no mystery to this. There's no Greek word that actually unlocks that. This is exactly what it says. He fills a, a basin, a bowl with water, and then he goes and he washes people's feet. Now, the significance of this has, is multiple levels. First of all, if you notice, there's no help. It is Jesus that stood up. It is Jesus that took action. It is Jesus that laid aside his garments. It is Jesus that took the basin. It is Jesus that went over to the, uh, it's not a faucet, I guess that'd be more running water. He went over to whatever the bucket is with water and he filled it with water. And then he takes that water and he goes from disciple to disciple and he washes their feet with a towel and he scrubs with his own two hands. There is no help. This is Jesus doing it all. There's no angels coming by. There's no waving his hands over the feet to make them cleaner. He does it himself. He, he comes up to the disciples, and he does it just the way they need it. If their feet were dirtier than others, he scrubbed them a little bit more. But he left them with clean feet of his own choice, of his own purpose, of his own hand. He does it by himself because he wanted to. Because this is his purpose because this is what he wanted to do. He's not gritting his teeth and doing it. Oh, I guess I have to do this. Oh, I guess it's a concession. I guess there's nothing left to do. I guess I have to do this. He's doing it because he wanted to. It was all purposeful. It was all calm. Even though he knew all of redemptive history is coming to a conclusion, this is the way he brings it up. He ties a towel to his waist. And then he goes and he washes dirty feet of men who don't deserve it. This didn't happen in their culture. In fact, it's actually there's evidence that uh, it, um, Jewish slaves were not even asked to do this because it was too menial of a task. But he does it. And he becomes for them what they could have never imagined they needed. He comes and he ministers to the disciples and he goes from person to person and he just loves them with his whole heart and he cares for them. And there's no grand soliloquies and there's no grand explanations. He just lets his actions speak all the volume. And he takes the towel and he takes the water and he scrubs. And with that, he moves on to the next person and he loves them perfectly. 
And he just does it with such determination, with such calm, with such gentleness, with such grace. And he just goes from person to person. And, and we have to see this picture. This is the glory of God expressed. Salvation, the cross, are just like this feet. It's not a concession to man because I guess I have to have fellowship and so I guess I'll have to save them. What's happening right here is the divine character. This is the glory of God on display. When you see Jesus scrubbing feet, it is the glory of God on display. When you go and you serve somebody out of obedience to the Father, that's the glory of God on display. It's not a concession. It's not a mistake. It's not a, oh, I guess I have to do this. It is heaven. It is heaven on earth. And that's what we're really seeing here, is that Jesus is bringing all these grain. He knows he's going to have all things. He knows he's going to be sitting with the Father. He knows he's going to take his throne. And the way that that expresses himself is to go and wash feet. This is the divine character on display. This is the glory of heaven showing itself. This is the redemption of man being at the microcosm of the redemption of man, this is Jesus going to the cross and what he's going to do. He's going to wash feet. He's going to wash dirty, sinful man's feet for their good and their good alone. There was nothing in these men that made him do it. There was nothing about these men that made them more worthy. There was nothing about their feet that were better looking than other feet, right? He did it because he wanted to. He did it because that's the job that he had. That's the purpose he came for. That's what the Father gave him to do. And from eternity past, he knew each one of these men, and he knew what he wanted to do. And he knew every one of their mistakes. And he knew every one of their problems. And he wouldn't wash their feet anyways. Because that's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. It has to be our glory as well. That's the example he's leaving. I want you to think about this. I want you to take all the theology you've got in your head and I want you to leave it here because this is what it is. Does your theology lead you to wash feet? It did for Jesus. Why can't it leave it here? Why can't that lead you here too? Why can't that lead me? Why can't I go? Does that mean going to a far off nation to preach the gospel? Amen. Does that mean going to the nursery and changing diapers? Amen. It's got to lead us to the same place. It has to. This is the love of the Father for the Son. This is the love of us for Christ. It's expressed through the washing of feet. It's expressed through the washing of feet. Let's go to verse 6. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? So Peter, um, we all have to love Peter, uh, because Peter is probably an expression of all of us to some degree. Peter likes to talk when you really shouldn't. Right? Um, I grew up and my parents always had a principle that said it's better to keep uh, your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool uh, than to open it and remove all doubt. And I will tell you, I violate that principle on a daily basis. Um, and Peter is my man who loves to do it on a regular basis as well. So Peter is sitting here as Jesus is going through this. And he's doing what you really never should do as a, uh, as a teacher or as a, as a Messiah, certainly. And he says, are you washing my feet? He, he kind of, he probably means well, but he's questioning what Jesus is doing. Are you doing this? Should you be doing this? I don't think I can let you do this. So John 13, 7, Jesus says, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but you will after these things. And so what he's trying to tell Peter is, I got this. This is what I want to do, Peter. And yes, you don't understand it, and you don't fully grasp it, and yes, there's bigger things at play right here than you understand, but I got this, Peter. So what is he telling Peter? Stop. Trust me. Just trust me, Peter. Just chill, right? Let me do this for you. And so what does Peter do? Not that. So John 13, 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And in Greek, it's actually like a double negative, not the same kind of double negative we think of. He uses two negative words to try to say, you will never wash my feet. No, never. I can't let you do that. Now, why would Peter be doing that? Because he's got to protect the glory of the Messiah. Jesus, you're too good for this. We have to make sure that everyone knows that. I have to protect your honor. I have to be the one that's going to make sure that you are put on display. That's what Peter tries to do. But guess what Jesus just asked him to do? Nothing. I just need you to sit still. 
It's really hard to wash your feet when you're moving around too much. It's really hard to hear the word preached when your gums get in the way, right? I've had that happen many times where I've actually destroyed the word of God by speaking. Sometimes the best way to just do it is just to let God speak. Let the word go through. And here, in this case, what Peter needs to do is just sit still. Sit still. Let Jesus wash his feet. That's what he needs to do. Jesus, but Peter says, no, I can't let you do that. You're too important. I have to set you on display. Don't you get it? I have to, I have to glorify God, and I, and I can't let you do this this way. And Peter says, or Jesus says to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Unless you let me do this, Peter, you will have no inheritance. You have no place in the kingdom. You have no place in my ministry. You will be a foreigner to me unless you let me do this. So Peter, all right, then I get it. In that case, then wash all of me, right? He says, wash me from head to toe. Wash also my hands and my head. That's kind of just a way of saying, wash all of me. I've got it. So now he swings from, I can't let you do this to, okay, do it all the way. And again, it sounds good. It sounds wonderful. It sounds like Peter got it. And now he's throwing himself at the feet of Jesus. But what is he really doing? He's still trying to get in the way. He's still trying to guess what Jesus wants. But that's not what he needs to do. What he needs to do is sit still. Just sit still. That's all I want you to do, Jesus. Sit still. Peter, I just need you to sit still. Let me wash you. The will of God here is not for you to be zealous. The will of God is for you to trust. The will of God is to take all the grand, glorious things that you know and to let the will of God flow through you. It is to let these things happen that God has desired. If you trust me, then you will follow me. If you trust that I know what I'm doing, then you're going to sit still and let me do it. And if you trust that when it's time to move, then you're going to follow me wherever I go. And Peter gets this later on. He does. He'll be crucified upside down if tradition's true. He gets it. And he will follow Jesus where he leads. But right now, this is the Peter that we all know and love because he speaks from our own heart who tries to get in the way instead of just stopping and listening. So he's trying to guess what Jesus wants. And so in verse 10, which is notoriously difficult to translate, um, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Now, this one has a lot of different flavors to it. We're not going to get into all of them. Just suffice it to say, here's a summary of how this works. He who is bathed is clean. Why? Trust. Simple trust. Trust and have faith. Let Jesus work in you. Let Jesus work on you. Let Jesus work through you. That's what we're trying to get to. This is the message to Peter. Peter, you don't need to stand up and take a stand. I just need you to stand up and walk with me. Or in this case, I need you to sit down and listen. I just need you to just be you. I don't need you to be something amazing. I don't need you to be something glorious. I don't need you to tell me how glorious I am. I already know that. I've got, I've got the Father telling me how glorious I am. So your praise is kind of not that big a deal, right? He knows who he is. He knows who, what's inside of him. He knows what that's all about. And what he wants from Peter is not grand expressions of love. He just wants him to trust. And so he's leading him to this point. You don't need a whole new bath, Peter. You're already clean because of the trust that you have for me. And so I need you to just trust me. I need you to trust me. Now he says this in verse 11, for he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. Now just as a sidebar, it's pretty, you've seen it, you understand it, many of you have probably heard great sermons about it, but look at Judas. There is no indication in any of this passage that Judas was skipped. As Jesus goes around the table washing feet, Judas was included. He was not excluded. There's nothing that indicates that he was excluded. And so they go around and he washes the feet of Judas. And Judas 
has Jesus serving him, the Messiah, the glory of God is right there at his feet, caring for him with his own two hands, pouring water, washing his feet, explaining its meaning to some degree, watching Peter goof and make mistakes, and Jesus explaining it even more, and he listens to this. This is a man who walked with Jesus for years. He has literally the hands of Jesus on his feet, and he's still betrayed This is how close you can get to religion. This is how close you can get to Jesus and still miss the whole gospel. This is is a dire warning that we have for us. If you're sitting in this room and this isn't falling lightly on you, if the word of God means nothing to you, if you come here because you think church is kind of cool and I want to make sure my kids grow up moral, you're missing the point. This church will not save you. This gospel will save you. If you want to know what Jesus is, you need to sit still and listen. You need to sit and trust and let him wash your feet. That's what matters. Judas felt the hands of Jesus on his feet but did nothing with it. He didn't care. He was this close and still ended in perdition. Don't let that happen to you. Come to Jesus, let him wash your feet, listen to this gospel, see the Savior, see the ultimate fulfillment of Passover, trust, trust that your sins are going to be forgiven, trust that you aren't the perfect man that you're still in this world, trust that you still have a ton of mistakes, but then let the Savior work on you, trust that he knows what he's doing. And that's what Peter needed to do, is trust that Jesus knew what he was doing. Trust that he knew what he was doing. It's not complex. It's profound, but it's not complex. He washed the disciples' feet because he wanted to. He took all the glory of God and he washed his feet. In verse 12, this is what he's trying to explain to them. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, so he's complete, he's done, he's, got, he's taken on his outer image again, he's taken on the, the robe that they've gotten used to seeing as their master, as their teacher, as their Lord. They understand, they understand this. He sits down again because he's done, and he says, do you know what I've done for you? Do you understand all these things that have just happened? And of course the answer is no, they don't quite get it. They don't really grasp it and they won't. They won't for quite a while yet until the cross is explained to them. And that's okay. But they need to understand what's going on. They need to think beyond where they're at. Right now all they see is a Passover where they're going to remember Israel's deliverance. And he wants them to realize, and they soon will, that the deliverance that he's going to deliver goes well beyond any kind of national implications. That he's going to deliver something for all eternity. And so he asked them, do you understand these things? And he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, you're right. You're not wrong. You've got these things down. This is exactly who I am. I am your teacher, and I am the Lord, and I am the Messiah, and you know it. But there's a difference between what they say now and what they're going to say later when Thomas puts his hand in his side and realizes the risen Lord. He says, my my Lord and my God. That's a different expression than teacher and Lord. And so they get it. And right now they don't quite understand, but they soon will. And so he leaves them with this. And this is what I want to leave you with this morning. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, if I've taken the grand and glorious things of heaven, and that leads me to wash feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You need to take your glory. You need to take all the things that God's blessed you with. You need to take all these things that you have. Your theology needs to lead you to the end. This is the end. If I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This is not about service so much as it is about heart. If, if my love for the Father, if the glory of heaven moved me to serve, then where is your glory leading you? What's important to you? What, what are you going for? Where does your theology bring you? Where does your glory, what does God's blessing mean to you? Does it bring you to wash other people's feet? Does it change the way that you view this church? Does it change the way you view your neighbor? Does it change the way you view your workplace? Does it change the way you view your kids that really hard to meet? The, the, I say that with my kids. Does it change the way that you really want to understand this world? Does it bring you to change? For I have given you an example in verse 15 that you should do as I have done to you, that I have shared heaven with you through service. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who has sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them, does it lead you to action? Does the glory of God mean so much to you that you just want to run out and serve him? Sometimes that means sitting still and being still and knowing your God. And sometimes that means running out and feeding the homeless. Sometimes that means just sitting quietly and lifting up prayer. And sometimes that means going into the nursery and changing diapers. Sometimes it leads you to Mexico. Sometimes it leads you to preach on a corner. Sometimes it leads to a lot of things. But are you doing it because you see the glory of heaven in these things? Or are you doing it because you have to? Are you doing it because that's what's supposed to happen? That's what Jesus said is to go wash feet. Yeah, but he's not really saying go wash feet. He's saying go love somebody I like the love that I shared with you. That's what he's trying to get you to say. Will you go out and do them? Will you go out and love because Jesus also loved us? This is the way that he loved them to the end. We're back where we started. He loved them to the end. He shared heaven's glory right there in a way that's not supernatural, that's very ordinary. He loved them by just washing feet, by getting down, by dealing with their stinkiness, their, their, their weird-shaped feet, because we all have weird-shaped feet, and, and the bones and everything else, and he scrubbed, and he got the dirt out from between their toes, and he scrubbed all that off of them because he loved them. And he did it with his own two hands. Can you do the same? Will your theology lead you to this? This is what I was floored with as I'm going through this. Jesus is so practical, and yet he's never without the Father. His, his glory of heaven, the glory of God is always on his mind. He knows all these things. This is the Son of Man has been given dominion over all of the creation. And where does it take him? It takes him to love. It takes him to heal. It takes him to minister Everything's an expression of grace. Grace to the undeserving. Mercy to those who don't deserve it. He, he loves them with his whole heart. That's what his theology means to him. He never sacrifices the glory of God for the glory of man. But he never lets the glory of God stop him from loving man either. The glory of God meant loving man. And he loved his own. And he loved them to the end. All right. So let's pray. All the way, we'll just keep talking. Lord, we, we thank you for these precious words. The precious words that uh, it's difficult to do justice to. These precious pictures that we can't really seem to grasp in their entirety. But Lord, we know that you are the great and glorious Messiah. Lord, we know that you are the one that brought heaven to earth. Lord, we, you came from your throne on heaven. You manifested it in a, in a way that we can't understand. We know that you are the glory of heaven right here walking among us. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray that you would just teach us many things from your word. We pray that we would be moved as people to follow you wherever that may lead us. Lord, we pray that we would be the expression of the glory of God to this world as you work in us, as you transform us, as you work through us. Lord, we pray that you would just have your way with us. Let us be your people. Let us walk with you in your way and that you have uh, the perfect and ultimate glory that, that you deserve through your people. In your name we pray. Amen.